Oh my gosh. Oh, you look so good. Okay, I'm gonna pull up some questions. I'm gonna try to make this relatively concise because I know it's your evening and I have okay. recently discovered how precious evening time is. <laughs> How's it going, by the way, with all of that? Oh my gosh, it, you know, it's great. Um, I think about our meeting all the time, Nina. I'm just so grateful you spent <laughs> that time advising me. Um, and Richard, I think about our interview too. Nina, uh, Eponine, I've talked to both of your parents an awful lot about being parents in the theater. Um, and they've always, you know, had such wonderful advice for me. But I think it might also be partially because they have such a wonderful kid in you, so. Thank you. <laughs> Who's busier than the three of us combined right now? This girl. Oh. Hi, I'm Nina Leokino. I'm Eponine Lee. And I'm Richard. And we worked together on a play called Carried Away on the Crest of a Wave by David Yi, directed by Nina Lee Aquino. Starring Kawa Ada, Ash Knight, um, Eponine Lee, myself, <laughs> Richard Lee, um, John Ng, Mako Nguyen, and Richard Zapiri. And the creative team for Carried Away. The set and costume designer was Camille Ku. Uh, lighting design by Michelle Ramsey. Sound design and composition by Michelle Ben Simon. And it was stage managed by Joanna Barata. Um, so I really mostly just want to focus on not, uh, we'll get to the play and acting and process a little bit, um, maybe towards the end, but I'm just really interested in your experience um, of working together. So maybe we'll just start with a question for the three of you and you can take a turn. Um, the play was in 2013, so Eponine, you were six years old. Um, so I was wondering if one by one you could just, when you think about that time, which was like a long time ago for you in particular, Eponine, <laughs> yeah. Is there a recollection that sticks out in your memory, like a moment or a sensation or an image? Yeah, I think so. I, I have a lot of ones, but the one that really comes back to me when I think about the play is um, I'm basically behind this, this curtain, this really like see-through curtain, and I like go over to touch it like that, and then I slowly walk back. <laughs> that's, that's the moment that I remember. <laughs> Oh wow! Yeah, mm. mysterious. Yeah, yet so meaningful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are you? Uh, memorable moment. Let's see. Uh, there's so many. Uh, I would just collect them all into saying that uh, it was really amazing to do really naughty things in the theater. And, and what I mean by that is, we flooded the theater with water. <laughs> we were swimming in the like the pool every day. Before I started the show, uh, Kawa Ada and I would literally take, go into the shower stall in the dressing room upstairs and dump like the warmest water we could think of on us because the rest of the water was super cold. Um, you know, there was plastic everywhere and we got to do all sorts of really um, creative and innovative and fun things. So, so that to me was always like the whole show has all these really beautiful, memorable moments where we got to be naughty. Oh, I'm glad you feel <laughs> naughty about it, amazing, because it was a bitch on our side. <laughs> I mean, I, it, it was a challenge. Um, I mean, a beautiful challenge at that, but a challenge nonetheless. And, you know, um, really ambitious. And I'm so grateful that, you know, I had a creative team and a cast and Tarragon kind of just fully embracing that challenge. I mean, I've never done any kind of water work ever. I mean, I've only seen them on, you know, like special TV shows like, you know, I like I just saw a dance show that had water on TV and and all of that stuff but to actually fully realize that 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 was terrifying uh and challenging and of course we did have our challenges so if you're to ask me like what stuck out to me it's it's overcoming it's overcoming those challenges one by one like we just had a to-do to list 
And if I can cross that off and it, and it happened smoothly a couple of times during our runs and our previews, then we were golden. When, when my team and I would be like, okay, that, that, that hard scene is coming, it's coming and we're all holding hands. And then when it happens beautifully, like, yes, yes, you know? So those, we had a couple of those, right? Because it was always terrifying, you know, especially when previews started. And of course you're always like, it's just a preview, just, but it never is, you know, every show it's high stakes and you want it to be as perfect uh, to go as perfect as you can and of course it never did for us but you know every little triumph you know water triumph technological triumph that we had it, it was just such a big huge deal for our team but you talked about challenge just now and I'm, I'm wondering I imagine it was a technical challenge because of the nature of the show the set um but but also the three of you are a family, two parents, <laughs> one six-year-old child at that time doing the yeah. show. And I, I'm wondering, like for Richard and Nina, like y- you were planning the play in the rehearsal period, and what were you what were you thinking about also in terms of of bringing Eponine into that? What planning had to go into that for you? Yeah, I, I'm going to answer that because I I did not expect it wasn't in in my mind to even cast her. Okay, but. As, as David uh, was really finishing up the script and it was becoming really clear that, you know, we really needed a real child and not that an older actor would play a child. Because we were always, that's always the case, right? Whenever there's a child role, we, I never think to like cast right away a real child. It was always going to be, so I had just assumed, la la la, like it would just, it would just be one of the, like we were already a cast of how many, right? And so I'm like, I'll use one of them, <laughs> you know? Um, but when it was being really evidently clear that, you know, the, the role really, the impact of it would have been tenfold if, if we casted a real child. To me, that was very terrifying as a director. And so I, I was thinking, 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 I mean, there's a, amazing child actors out there, but the fact that I've never worked water before, um, it was a big ensemble. Um, and uh, uh, like it's a new play all those things i'm like the last thing i want to think about is how to direct a child that i have never met and have no relationship with and so i was just um i was just not confident that i can uh direct a child and like worry about the parents hovering over me and like so who is a kid that i can feel really comfortable and yell at and not feel bad and not worry about (laughs) parents screaming down my throat you know so I'm like I'm just gonna cast our daughter uh because you know I at least you know I I I know how to shape her mold her I can talk to her I can be myself around her um and not have to worry about the all kinds of filters um I'm just gonna take a risk and of course David I, I have to say David and Epps have a special kind of relationship like like Epps is if you ask David, is the only child in, in David's life that you know he has space for in his heart. Um, and so in many ways, I don't know if David really wrote this part uh, picturing Eponine because they had already previously worked before in a very short stint at Fujian. So David was happy about it, but I was just like, okay, well, I'm just going to take a risk and, and just see. And so that's really you know, me suggesting Epps was purely for my convenience, not knowing that really getting to know her as an artist during the the, the process was the gift, right? Like I, I did not know, I, I honestly did not know the capacities of this. I was just testing. I was just testing. And, and again, because I was at ease with her, I can direct her like I was directing anybody else in that ensemble. And, and because the way kind of Richard and I had raised her, you know, there was no, um, I wasn't worried about attachments of like her clinging on to me or clinging on to her father, that she can create those relationships with each of the cast members and not everybody would be able to take care of each other and especially this little one uh, mm-hmm. back then. Um, so, so yeah, that, that really was the one that came to be like just not knowing. And then again, I, for me, one of the gifts that this production really has given me is really kind of discovering Eponine's own artistry at such a young age. And P.S., that was the only time you and I have ever worked together. She has since then worked with other freaking directors across the city and country. 
right? And has yet to come back to me and we have yet to work together <laughs> on anything. So just saying. <laughs> It's like, oh, Eponine, remember the little people on your way up the ladder, right? When you're on your way up there, um, <laughs> you know, don't forget where it started. But uh, the, the thing that we had to be very careful about at the beginning was planning logistical challenges. You know, uh, at the time she was going to school, uh, junior kindergarten, right? Yeah. Junior kindergarten. Kindergarten. And she also had daycare. She was in a daycare. The school has a daycare as well. Uh, and that, that's the fortunate part about all of this because, you know, we, we were, you know, as artists, having a, a subsidy from the City of Toronto was so helpful and instrumental in us being able to practice our craft and be working parents and having a child that was in an educational institution from the daytime to have um, people to interact with, to have other kids her age to be able to, you know, speak with, play with, learn from uh, was so uh, such a great gift on every level. But that meant if we were gonna have her in the show, it's this logistical, like technical, crazy planning. You know, um, what time do we drop her off in the morning? Thank goodness the daycare has morning drop off. What time do we finish rehearsals? Usually 6 p.m. Okay, the daycare ends at 6 p.m. Can I be like, can Nina release me from rehearsal? What's the latest point? How long does it take to, from Tarragon down to the daycare? <laughs> like we would map every single route. Um, and that was the sort of careful orchestration of how we could make this all work. I think the biggest worry I remember, Richard, was her nap time. Oh, yes. Um, yeah. Because if this didn't want to have a nap before the show, this was grumpy pants. Like, I just, so I just remember <laughs> us and everybody really trying to figure out how to really um, create her like little room yeah. into like a nap haven so that she comes from, from daycare, she works and then she goes into a nap, especially when it was showtime, comes from daycare, takes a quick nap and then she's ready to do like a two and a half hour, three hour. <laughs> <laughs> Till 11 right? o'clock at night. Till 11 o'clock at night. So, and this one hates napping already to begin with. So it was just super important, um, you know, so that she didn't didn't have a meltdown in the middle <laughs> of, of all of it, you know, which I don't think you ever did. Um, no. You're pretty good about that. Some but be uh, my my pre-show naps are also very important. <laughs> so I get that. Right. <laughs> I, th I think the irony is that I think some of the pictures that I sent you, there's a picture of me and John sleeping. It was supposed to be Eponine's nap time. And she stole our camera and took a photo of me napping and John napping. I, I love that. Um, Eponine, I'm wondering if you, and I know you grew up around the theater and you grew up around David and Fujian and, and, and so I'm sure it wasn't unfamiliar to you, but I'm wondering if you remember like six and a half years ago when your parents came to you with this idea and how they proposed it to you. Um, I actually... Carrie, like doing the play itself, and I even remember like bits and pieces of rehearsal are actually super vivid to me. Like I don't remember a lot from when I was five or six years old, but like carried away was just, I can imagine it. Like I even remember like, yeah, my nap times and how I would refuse to sleep or like, you know, the rehearsal process and working with all the people. Like I can really remember it um, super vividly in my mind. So, <laughs> but do you remember like when I came to you and asked you if you wanted to be in the show? Maybe. Like I don't maybe, even remember. Maybe. I think I just told her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I said, you're going to be in the show. You have no choice. We need a kid. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't remember either how, how I asked you. Well, I think I remember that. I don't know if you want, like, so, so the, the story that I remember is that Nina and David like talk about Eponine and they're like yeah it would be really great it would be really great but what do we do if she's like just <laughs> not interested in doing pirouettes in the middle of like the rehearsal hall what's going to happen then uh, and that's one of the pictures that I sent you is this peek through the doorway and that was uh, from what we talked about it was like we're going to have her in for rehearsal we're going to treat her like a regular actor and we're going to see how she does so if she responds well, then great. Let's let's integrate her as into the part of the show. Let's see how she responds. And if she does pirouettes, then we know that we have her answer. <laughs> and so I remember feeling so nervous for her, like 
being outside the rehearsal hall, but having this little sliver that I could peek through to see her working with John and working with Nina and just watching her kind of just be the, the pro actor that yeah. I could never be, yeah. <laughs> right? Like, I mean, I, I you it. know, I mean, when I'm directing, I'm, I'm pretty focused, but I just do remember that moment, the first time I directed her with John, you know, and that, that iconic scene, like, you know, Tarragon has that, production photo of her and John right um and everybody almost always remembers that like I just remember uh the part of me like I was directing the two of them but I was just like oh my god my kid is doing it like mm. like and then some like again the gift of knowing like I think you're actually talented like I actually think like because she was just um there was, again, not in my, when I had directed you, like not a meltdown, not nothing. She was writing things down. She was asking questions. I was throwing stuff at her to kind of inform her choices. And yeah, I just remember directing that scene quite um, with ease. It, it, it wasn't easy, but it was with ease. And then when we finally had kind of a sketch of that scene, I remember opening the doors that, of course, the actors, you know, they were just in the lobby hanging around. Like, <laughs> and so I, I purposely opened the doors and I said, okay, you guys, let's run it again. And they ran it. And I just remember Mako and Richard Zepieri like peeking and they were just like, and then at the end of that scene, like Mako's like wiping her eyes. Like <laughs> everybody was bawling their eyes out like because it, it's already like it's done right that scene is supposed to tug at your heartstrings right and uh, yeah I just remember everybody's kind of like wiping their tears and kind of like that's amazing <laughs> so um I'm like okay I think I think we have an actor I think you know we're we have an, our, our ensemble you know that confirmed it so <laughs> oh that's so beautiful uh, well I want to talk about that scene um um, from from two angles, but maybe we'll talk to you, Eponine, first. Your partner was John Ng, and what can you tell us about like working with him, your process, and did you learn anything from him? Oh, um, I remember some of the conversations I had with him. Um, well, <laughs> I remember when we were, I think, backstage. Um, I was talking to him, and he was like, "Oh, you farted," and I was like, "What? When?" <laughs> And he was like, while you were talking, you farted. And I was like, oh. <laughs> it's kind of random. But oh, I remember talking about that. And I think I remember when he would lean down to me or bend down to me um, to talk to me like face to face. He would sort of spit in my face by mistake. But that was only because now I know that he was just so passionate and in the seat. <laughs> but I, yeah, I remember um, even like, I think there was one where we had like a fake chocolate bar and I remember him passing it to me and like so in character and I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> I was I was like, I don't know, I was very impressed as well. And I don't know, I, I, yeah, I kind of remember talking to him a bit, which was really nice. And it was such a, I mean, it's such a sad scene. It's this orphaned child waiting to reconnect with what's left of her family intense, I imagine, for both of you as Eponine's parents. Was it hard to watch her go through that? Uh, as a director, no, I was loving it. <laughs> <laughs> like, I was just like, oh, man. Um, and mind you, because, I, I, you know, as a director, you, you always hope for the growth of that scene. So by the time we were previewing, um, the, her choices just kept getting better and better, like just more refined and more specific. And so there was one time the way you got the chocolate bar, I don't remember, I, I don't know if you remember this conversation I had with you, so I, I asked you like, because I just noticed the way you pushed that chocolate bar back to Uncle John, I then asked you after, during our notes, I said like, I, I really love the way you pushed it back. It was different. There was a little bit of a, hmm, you know, as opposed to normally you would push it back really carefully. And then you told me that you realized that that you were mad at Uncle John's character. And I said, why, why? Like what made you think that you're, you were a little bit angry at him? Because you felt like he was patronizing you. That like she, that he doesn't really, like he doesn't, he, like him giving you a chocolate bar, it's like, fine, whatever, you're gonna be cold hearted about it then I'm gonna be that too I'm gonna be just as stubborn so you were you were also trying to copy his behavior 
and so that both of you were kind of prideful in that way. So that 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 you know, and again, so I was I was really interested in the the, the tiny shifts that she was making because whether she knew it or not, she was making it, and um, and whether that's instinct or whatever, like it was great. Like I was just really enjoying. I, again, as a director, I just had to. I, I couldn't really put the mom hat on in that way so I, I i was just vested in in seeing her really get to know the scene get to know john and john's character more and watch her grow mm -hmm. but you mm -hmm. have the like unlike richard i think had the ability <laughs> to kind of uh peek once in a while <laughs> if you weren't in the scene or in character well i, I never really got to see most of the scene because i was i was always off stage in the lobby waiting to go on during the scene as her uncle right like so there was a different kind of emotional journey for them there but uh, I mean to Nina's point watching and engaging with Eponine like watching her work and ask questions was a master class for any actor in terms of being present in terms of the growth and development and logic of a, of a character a scene and a journey um, you know like I, I keep I keep telling the story a lot of uh, in the in a later scene with uh, uh, Agent Nguyen and uh, Lenore, where she she has the ch Calder the child, you know she she one day when we're getting ready for that scene, I'm upstairs, I'm combing my hair, putting my shirt on, being all professional FBI. <laughs> she walks up next to me in the mirror, and I'm here, and she just kind of looks up at me, and nods, starts combing her hair ever so neatly and i'm like what are you doing we have to be on in like four minutes or whatever and i'm like eps what are you what are you doing she's like oh i just realized that you know lenore would really want calder's hair to be perfect you know that, that she just would invest all this time into him and you know i think your story absolutely just illustrates her uh, innate process uh, as an actor Mm -hmm. You know, and that's a gift on both levels, right? Watching the performance that is ultimately given and ultimate, and watching her craft this performance from every angle. And and I, I just want to say, like, because Eponine also had a kick-ass wrangler, like a child wrangler, Stephanie um, Zhang, um, who, who, of course, like, for all intents and purposes, was also one of my assistant directors because she needed to know so that she can also really focus her attention with, with Epps. But there was one day, and I don't know if people know this, there was one um, performance where uh, I wanted Steph to see the show. So I said, okay, so Steph, take me through your track so that I, we can switch places. And it was the biggest mistake of my life, <laughs> okay? The... So when I finally, so she took me through her track and that was fine. But when, when now the, that performance came, I don't think I've ever been so nervous. Like I, like the, I take it for granted that I always sit on the audience, even when I'm doing rehearsals, because I have no idea the amount of magic and traffic and work that goes on backstage. And so when I was her Wrangler backstage, I was the most idiot person like <laughs> Eponine had to be like okay mom sit over there please and don't move like <laughs> because I was just like I almost hit a prop I didn't know where to stand I was almost in some actor's way when they were doing a quick change <laughs> I was just like and so Ep I just remember Eponine like taking both my hands and like guiding me to a box somewhere to, to sit me down and she's like I got this like <laughs> so just like oh like I was just horrible but like I just kind of for the rest of the performance I was just like watching everybody like there the backstage um choreography just had its own it's its own show and how my kid from a Wrangler's point of view like she just knew she was like stand by on the curtain peeking through listening to the the cues and meanwhile I'm like is it time yet no <laughs> is it time like do you need to go I was like distracting her <laughs> and but she just she's just like yeah 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 hold on like I I'll and then she goes and I'm just like oh my god I just let my kid like I was just <laughs> Oh, never again. I she just still remembers to be quiet, right? Backstage. Right, like, and she was the one that's like, shh, like, and then she's like, sorry. Like, I was, like, I was all over the place. 
Uh, I don't even remember that. Yeah, well, because you were just like, you were focused and, and channeled, whereas I was just like, <laughs> like <laughs> I didn't even give you your props. You just went to the props table and got what you needed. And then again, you were the one holding my hand and guiding me to where <laughs> I'm supposed to go. It was so embarrassing. I'm like, oh my God, I suck at this. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. I mean, it sounds, it's so clear that any qualms you might have had as parents were reassured by the fact that she was just a pro. She knew the questions. She knew it was a story and a fiction. And... Other people's actors so much so like when she would hang out in the backstage, apparently, is that true? Like I heard, I think it was Richard Zippieri who was hanging out with her in the green room and there's the program sound. And then she was like playing on her iPad <laughs> and then the scene would go and then Zepier Zepier told me that she said, mm, that's not the line. <laughs> I could totally imagine myself doing that. Yeah, it's that. like, nope, that's not how it goes. <laughs> I probably like probably played a lot on my iPad backstage and maybe probably listened to the speaker. Um, I actually don't really remember a lot of backstage. Um, I more remember like the only time I remember backstage was like maybe when we were like waiting for cues and stuff or like when I was about to go on or um, I guess I remember NT Stephanie who is um, my I guess my chaperone or child wrangler was backstage and I was on, I, I was um, gonna go backstage and then Uncle Kawa who was with me in the scene slipped because there was water on the stage and everyone thought that it was me because they didn't see and <laughs> They were like, oh my gosh, Epps, are you okay? And I was like, that wasn't me. That was Uncle Kawa. <laughs> and I was oh, like, it's like <laughs> who cares? And they were like, oh, no wonder. You sounded so heavy when you <laughs> fell. Yeah. Okay, well, let's talk about this amazing set then. Um, I'm, I'm curious. Uh, well, Nina, I'd love to hear a little bit about the process working with your creative team coming up with this incredible design. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the struggle of working with it. Yeah, I think, I mean, right from the get-go, um, you know, I, David and I, like, we've been in this together as, like, a director, playwright for, you know, 20-odd years now, I think, or a little bit less than that. But, you know, <laughs> because of that relationship, David just, it. I think it has allowed David to just write the most impossible of <laughs> impossible things because he knows, like, oh, Nina will take care of that. That's <laughs> Nina's problem, you know? So I think when this landed on my lap, um, I don't know, the instinct, you know, whenever I have, um, I get together with my creative team and, we, you know, my process in, in that, you know, uh, I do have um, jam sessions with the, my complete team. I don't really go on um, solo meetings with you know like everybody needs to be together so that we're all we're all on the same page and the vision is built together so I think it was one of those the first jam session I had with my creative team everybody from me to like the you know Michelle Ben Simon who did the sound like we were all like we need to have water like there was no one person that said mm, maybe for some reason all of us were when we were reading it individually and then came together the consensus was we got to try this you know and and the metaphor you know like the actual water was enough um of a, a big thing that we were all invested and determined to have that you know just because it was like the, the one thing that we can use to really thread all of the standalone plays Right. And it was the thing that really started, you know, the power of water and, you know, the, that started um, David's imagination. Uh, and again, like it's power, it's it's power to destroy, it's power to build, it's power to drown, it's power to push, you know, forward. You know, so we just wanted to really explore that um, physically and literally on the stage. Um, so yeah, you had, you know, Caddy who, who kind of built, um, you know, a really strong metaphor around the water, knowing that, you know, well, how can we contain this world, you know, and we know that the world is going to be made up of water. So, so therefore, like, that's kind of how we came about in terms of what, what were the four walls of that theater 
what, what, what the function of the four walls of that theater was, was to really hold the water in as many creative ways as possible. So that's kind of how it came to be. And therefore, you know, knowing that the world is about that and that water was an instrument and that would seep into everybody's lives in all of the plays, then our decisions on props and costume was really affected by that. So, you know, even when we were trying realistic things, it always came back to like, what if it was made of water instead? And it always worked. So therefore, like the pie, you know, which we started with a real pie, just didn't work. Whereas when, when Mako finally picked up like a pie container filled with water and tossed it and like the effect of that and seeing the violence that water can have in that moment was just like, that's it. You know, we just got to trust that the world that we built, um, that everything around it would, would, would fall magically into place and would match that world because it's true to that world. Right. So that's kind of how, we came up with that. And Richard and Eponine, you had to be in the water a little <laughs> more than Nina did maybe. Yeah. Um, can you talk about that experience? I just remember, cause the water, it wasn't like really deep or anything. It was like maybe like this much water on the stage. So it only covered like a little bit of my foot. But I just remember like squashing in it, having fun. I even remember, I think like the first or second day that we got, that I got to be in it, I like slipped and then the, <laughs> my clothes were wet. But I had, I have, a, I had a lot of fun like on the set. Cause I was like, Yes, my first show, but also my first show on water. So that was <laughs> that was a big deal for me. And I, I yeah, I, I remember just like having fun in it, you know, splashing around. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, I, I would say, I mean, be, beyond the the technical difficulties of trying to get water that is um, temperately right for for people, um, I, I think the really interesting part, and and of course, this is always the the thing we want more in rehearsal is time, right? That uh, we were just on the cusp sometimes of finding really interesting ways to live in the water, be with the water, make it a part of the, the action in the world or how we're like discomforted by it. You know, we'd be in the rehearsal hall, we'd play, we'd explore, we'd have the scenes. And as soon as you added the water, it was completely different. And it was, in some ways, it was uh, automatically... Um, connective and deeper into what was happening in the scene. I, I know for sure the, the runner, um, the runner and swimmer story, uh, the first, uh, the second one that you see in the play, it made such a huge difference. The stakes in that scene, having water there, um, and uh, you know, like spending time. I think to to continue to mine that is what I what I craved more of. I want to jump around a little bit and just talk process and and, and ask you, Richard. You're in this play that has incredibly technical, incredible technical challenges in it. It's a really complex interwoven script. Your partner's directing it. Your daughter is in it. You're playing like a ton of different roles and you have to create kind of a separate uh, performance for each of them. What was your process like as an actor on this one? <clears throat> well, um, <laughs> there was so much going on. It was a very busy time in our lives on, on, on many levels. Um, I would say, that um, the challenge always is to keep everything straight, right? You know, uh, you're either invested in the scene and, and the character and the work that needs to go into the scene, or you're trying to be a good partner <laughs> in life, <laughs> or, or you're trying to take care of your child at the same time. So uh, balance was certainly quite hard. And I learned, I, I will say personally, that I learned an immense uh, amount uh, from being able to try to balance and be rigorous in all of those things. Uh, and to be perfectly frank, I failed a lot. <laughs> I failed a lot at being a good actor because I was worried about other things. I failed a lot at being a good partner because, of course, I'm so invested, I'm so charged. Um, and that that's always tricky, right, when couples work together. And, you know, I, I think that it was probably one of the most like challenging times for us to work together, but also the most um, uh, amount of learning and the most rewarding. Um, uh, and then, you know, of course, the other layer was trying to be a good dad, <laughs> trying to like spit out lines and, and be good in the scene too, right? I, I, I think process wise, um, 
it's like life all the time. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not that I, I go and I'm an actor one minute and then I'm a parent another time. It's like everything full blast, 100%. Do you, I, I'm just thinking about what Richard was just saying, describing like watching both of you in these, in these different roles and the different role he was taking on. Do your parents have like a professional mode and a parent mode to you? Yes, they do. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And that's a good thing. I think, I don't think uh, it's good to see different sides of them. It's good to like be, you know, talking to them with different sides. Like I know Nana and my mom definitely wasn't like, <laughs> like eat your breakfast. Okay. She was more, he was like director mode, which I liked, which was good because it gave me structure and you know, it's in a professional environment. And I feel like my dad was kind of in between. I would bug him a lot, I think. <laughs> so um, I think it was like in between. Sometimes he would be like my dad. Sometimes he'd be my friend. Sometimes he'd be kind of just like, you know, an actor with me um, in the show. So I don't know. It kind of varies. But yeah, they, they both have a professional side. And I think I both got to see their um, more like director actor modes in the show. Yeah. I think it, like, I was, I, uh, to be honest, like, I had it easiest of, of the three of us, you know, um, and it's a tribute to, you know, like, Richard, if, if you failed at, uh, if you felt like you failed being a partner, uh, it's only because you allowed me to be the director I needed to be for the production. In the case of being a mom, in the case of being like that, like, he didn't let me have to worry about that. So in many ways, like, that's my failing. But, but it is what it is. That is the dynamic of that time. And, you know, so I kind of feel like with Eponine, I had the cleanest relationship in that I, I was her director. And then when I moved on to other scenes that she wasn't involved, like, that's the thing. Who does she turn to? Like, she didn't bug me. That's for sure. You no, know, I knew not to. <laughs> See, like, she knew not to. And so she would bug Richard, you know, her dad, who also might be busy trying to run lines, trying to do her, do his actor home. Like, do you know what I mean? So, like, I didn't have to deal with that, you know? And so I was mom, like, when it's time for it to be mom, really, it's when we all went home. Um, when, when it was time to go home, it was time to put her to bed, you know, and that was clean. Whereas Richard really had a very hard job of juggling both. Also, once the show opened, I'm free, you know, mind you, I would go home and the house was empty and I'm like, why, where's everybody? Oh, cause they're at a show. <laughs> um, and the show was three hours. Right. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a <laughs> long show. That long. So I just remember like waiting for them at home. And as soon as they got home, like I carried up an in and then we, we stripped her down, put her to bed ASAP because it was late, you know, but um, I knew what my role was. Like I've even forgotten at that time, oh, that I'm the director of the piece. Like I just, I had to just be mom at that time where I had two actors coming home from work. Right. But, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, I think for me, I was able to shine because this one, this one allowed me to, right? So that's important to know. <laughs> that's so beautiful. The idea of you picking them up, these sort of waterlogged actors stumbling home at the end of the night. Um, so I just re-listened to the audio recording, which I know you recorded just this year. Uh, what was it like for you revisiting this now? Uh, I will say that it was, it was interesting to revisit things. Um, I, I feel like as an actor who's aged, it's often nice to revisit something that you don't have to memorize. Yeah. <laughs> that it's on the page for you to just play. Um, we also, uh, Kawa was unavailable to, to be a part of it too, so that was also very uh, interesting to get a new take on uh, some of the characters, which was, it, that's always a delightful part of the, the process. Um, but I would say ultimately it was super refreshing to kind of revisit it a few years later with more life experience, you know? Mm. Speaking of life experience. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, for me, I felt it, I think I found it really nostalgic and like, you know, all the memories and like fun times and maybe not fun times just kind of rushing back to me while reading the script. And like, I can, I can even imagine I, while I was recording, I could imagine myself saying the lines, the very lines too, which is kind of weird, but really cool at the same time. And I also, I found it really interesting to reread the scenes because when I was, yeah, when I was in the show at the time, I didn't understand what was happening. I was just like, you know, I was kind of just playing around being in the moment. But now, like, I didn't know before that 
this that Uncle John's character is actually like his um his path crosses um my dad's character's path in that scene. I didn't know that at all. I just thought, I don't know, maybe they know each other, maybe they don't. I, I wasn't paying attention to that part. So it was really cool to see like the connections and how the play actually like went like I guess ran without being an actor like seeing it from a different perspective was really fascinating um and it was really weird recording because obviously <laughs> I like I wasn't I, I don't know I wasn't used to saying stuff into a microphone in front of like four people but <laughs> <laughs> it was it was really it was really nice to revisit it as well. Steph, is there anything that I haven't asked you that you'd like to touch on? Just looking at the photo, and I mean, I think there was one photo that I, I was like, oh, this would be an interesting story. Eponine, my favorite is the photo of your valuables with the truck in the <laughs> bag. Wait, which one is that? Yeah. Like, the one that Auntie Joanna oh. oh, put up with your, like, yeah. And I know it was a truck. There we go. <laughs> oh wow, I remember so much of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I remember opening night, whereas I was so excited. I was excited for the cast, um, you know, and a big relief, like, you know, so I just remember that, of course, on opening night, this one was just so not in the mood. Like, she was in this pretty dress, but she was so, like, I don't want to talk to anybody. So I just remember carrying, like, Richard or Cammy carrying her in the Tarragon lobby. And she was just not having it. Like, and I was just, I felt, I know that it was my heart broke a little because I'm like, you have no idea what opening night, like, means just yet of, of you know, your first show. But of course, she was just a six-year-old kid, and it was so late at night, and she might have not had a nap anyways, so I just remember that, too, that she was in such a pretty dress, but she was just like, <laughs> like, she just was not having it with anybody. Well, and yet, Eponine, now you're, like, you're in, into the arts. You're, you're an actor. You're a writer. What are you up to these days? What are you doing? <laughs> Um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, okay. I, I mean, I have a couple of like, I guess, interviews, right. For this, this movie that I, I did, I think one or two years ago called Queen of the Morning Calm by Gloria Kim. Um, so yeah, I have a couple of interviews there. Um, and that was also my first film. So that was kind of a crazy experience and I've never, I don't think, like, I haven't done this many interviews in my whole life, so that'll be interesting. Because it's uh, Queen of the Morning Calm is part of the Cinefest right now in Sudbury? Yeah, they're, they're, they're in a couple of festivals, and then it's running for a week uh, starting Friday um, on the 25th, for and, and then for a week at the Cineplex uh, Young and Dundas. Mm -hmm. You just finished a commission by Fujian. Oh, yeah, I just finished... Um, something with Uncle David, so it's really nice to talk to him again. <laughs> um, called, what was it called again? It was called The Transformation Project, and it's kind of like, it was with a bunch of other um, theater companies, um, including Fujian, and I got to like, you know, kind of collaborate with Uncle David, kind of bounce some ideas off, and then get feedback a day after. Um, so that was really fun. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> you just finished Summer Works. Oh yeah, and mm -hmm. I finished the Summer Works Small show. Winter from uh, part of the We Were, We Are, We Will Be analogy with Luke Reese and Daniele Bartolo uh, Bartolini. Um, so that was, that was also crazy. I didn't expect to have to do some theater <laughs> this summer because times were very crazy. So um, that was really nice to get to, you know, create something and not just sit at home and play video games the whole day. Um, That's my no wonder. Oh yeah, and then my dad and I, <laughs> my dad and I did a workshop um, with Unspun Theater called Little Wonder, um, and I don't know. It, it was also it, I, we did this two years ago. One, well, we did this twice, um, years in a row, and, and so it was really nice to see them again to do the whole process again and to see what the, how the script has changed yeah. um and then you had childish with uncle sunny drake and oh then you had sarah kitts's <laughs> workshop at the nac oh yeah that was virtual <laughs> and then now you're like in cahoots with uncle ravi and why not doing planning on some stuff 
I'm telling you, man, Courtney, between the three of us, this one, I don't even. <laughs> also, you can one yeah. more thing. What's so what was... did you do with Uncle David for the Transformation Project? Um, it was it was to answer your question, um, what was it, Ian? It's like, uh, how can we transform our society for the betterment of all? So what did you choose to do? Um, I chose to write a song about compassion, because I think, like, with compassion, we can really solve a lot of the world's problems. Um, <laughs> and then to that, to that, yeah. I'm going to spill her beans now. She, she basically has crafted, a, like, a, a small EP album over the summertime with, like, four or five amazing songs of which I like, I don't know, I'm, I'm hoping to. Really we're just waiting for one or two more songs and then we're gonna bundle it and then we're just gonna release it into the world. But, <laughs> yeah, and you also did YPT, um, did oh, a show, Uncle nice. Kevin Dyer, playwright Uncle Kevin that like wrote a piece for her so that she can do it during the pandemic. So she's been freaking busy. <laughs> Yeah, it's really reassuring to hear all of this happening because you know it's a hard time for the theater, right? We're we're trying to figure out how to move forward and reinvent ourselves post COVID. But the fact that you're making and sowing the seeds of all of these upcoming projects is so invigorating and reassuring. We're gonna be fine. Yeah. I make sure. That I agree. I agree. Okay. Well, I um, if I can just get you to, because I might cut this in. Um, say the name of the play and maybe um, maybe the three of you, you can just name some of your collaborators on the project, both when you did it. And I know you had um, Nadim in the, in the recording this time around. <laughs> so do you want us to say it all at once or one of us at a time to say it? Like Carried Away in the Crest of a Wave by David Yee, directed by Neil Aquino. <laughs> did I say it? Is that that was brilliant. Yeah, and I would say, and, and we, the actors involved were so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so and, -so -and, -so and the designers okay. were so-and-so. So you can say the title and the direct, uh, playwright director um, and you can, so you can go featuring and then say your, uh, do I say uncle or auntie? No, or no, I say no, the no, full name. Say okay. the full names and then I'll take care of the designers. Okay. okay. All right. You go. <laughs> Uh, sorry, before we begin, do, do I, do I sorry, want- that was just such a good clip of Nina directing the both of you, that, like, gold, gold. <laughs> 